Welcome back to This Is Your Bible. We're going to continue our Bible discussion on the general subject of giving God control of your life. And today we are focusing in on the specific part of our theme verse, verse John chapter 2, verse 16, the specific phrase in there, the lust of the flesh. Uh, we have a special guest with us continuing to uh, participate in the Bible discussion, Mr. Stan Isbell from Houston, Texas. Stan, welcome. Thanks very much, Mark. It's good to be here. Well, you and I have been engaged in this discussion for a bit now about God being in control of our lives. Right. And uh, on our previous program, we spent a little bit of time developing that thought. So mm -hmm. let's, why don't we start today's discussion with a little bit of a summary of some of the key points sure. that were uh, made in our last in our last discussion. Good idea. Uh, you'll recall that we uh, started with a story about tr a tree full of thorns and fruit that uh, the community was cutting down yearly, annually, and they were cutting all the branches off and burning them, but keeping the root system. And as a bystander, we went up and suggested they cut the root or go to the roots, dig to the root of the problem, and then remove the tree, and they wouldn't have that problem. But right. they were using it as sort of a uh, revenue and, and employment, and they were uh, annually getting together in fellowship, as it were, to cut down the branches uh, and haul them, haul them away. They've been doing this for generations, and I likened that, the metaphor, to our own society that hacks away at the branches of our social evils instead of getting to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem can be found in the Word of God. It is our authority. It is, it is the Word, the message that God has given us to trace back like a map, like a gardening manual, to find out where the root of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all those three channels, all social ills can be lumped into one or more of those three channels. So we go back through the Word of God to the beginning, to Genesis. We saw that uh, Adam and Eve failed from the voice of the serpent, which was not a puppet in the hands of a higher mentality, a fallen angel, which smacks of Greek mythology, but rather a beast of the field over which Adam and Eve had been given dominion, Genesis 1.26. Okay. okay, so then to, to be just absolutely clear here, then we came mm -hmm. away with uh, at least three key messages from that thought. Mm -hmm. One was uh, using the moral story mm -hmm. or the uh, the lesson to be learned from the metaphor of the trees was let's get to the root of the issue. Right. And we found that and we concluded that the root of the issue here can only be found in scriptures mm -hmm. and it's through the authority, God's authority is, is exposed to us, revealed to us in the scriptures that we learn how to deal with it. And I right. think the other important thing that we spent a little bit of time on was the idea of personal responsibility, right? right. That's right. and, uh, and again, I appreciate your willingness to share some of your um, personal life with us as we make that point, and more importantly, as we recognize that message out of the Scriptures, that it's us. We are responsible. We are personally responsible for what we think, what we say, what we do, if you will, the way we behave. That's right. Well, you'll recall I did reiterate a little about my past as being raised in a biblically-centered home and yet becoming very rebellious during the 60s and um, broke away from the uh, authoritative family uh, code tradition and uh, became, as it were, a professional hippie. Well, I gave, you, <laughs> I gave you a shot of that individual who was really barren as far as fruit of the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, mercy, and so on. But God, over the years, brought that barren man and his wife into a fruitful family, for one, and I swore I'd never have children. I'd never get married. I was a rebel and an independent. But uh, I have four wonderful children. And beautiful and, children, well, too. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, you, we can attribute that to the genetics of their mother. But nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> we've, so tried, <laughs> we've tried to rear them around the Word of God. We have done our daily Bible readings. We have a companion that we go by and read the whole Bible the Old Testament once through the year and the New Testament twice. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from the very beginning where they were able to speak, uh, we would speak the word, two or three words of a verse, and let them repeat it when they were very, very young. So we've tried our best, and, and so far it seems to have been working. That's a relatively old picture, too. But okay. it, personal uh, witness, I think, is valuable in these matters because it worked. It really worked for me. And I was really at rock bottom. And it, in the Word of God is really to be given all the credit. God has given all the glory for what you saw there. 
and any semblance of sanity that you might see sitting before you now okay. is all to the glory and the work of our Heavenly Father. And, and I'm glad you said that too, because when we hear the phrase personal responsibility, I think we are inclined to believe and to think that it's something that I have to do. Yeah. I have to become stronger. I have to learn to be a better person. I have to know more and, and be able to do more mm-hmm. in order to um, become a better person. No, I see what you mean. And in the end, it is, as, as you've described, it's God's Word working in our life. It's God working in our life right. through His Word. But what we have to do is that. yield. Not to interrupt you, but we have to yield. And that yield, yield me to the Word of God. We don't like authority. We resist it. We, you push yeah. our buttons yep. when somebody says, you can't do this. That's why I grew my hair. The establishment said, you can't do that. That's against our traditional norm. So we have an innate uh, resistance and rebellion against authority. And when this becomes our authority, we have to respond to his laws and his commands knowing the outcome. But what an enlightenment to have this wonderful word to be able to trust it and that it is absolutely reliable. You bet. So with that, let's Mm -hmm. go into our theme verse then in 1 John uh, chapter 2. Let's take a look at this again and have Mm -hmm. that be the basis for the, the, uh, the... Right. The, the discussions we're going to have today. Mm-hmm. We're in First John chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 15. Mm-hmm. And as we did previously, I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe you still have um, your King James Version. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And um, just wanted to be sure that we all understand that while they may be different versions, and we may see a bit of difference in some of the words and some of the, the way the words are presented, that mm-hmm. the message is the same. It this is, is God's good. message of truth to us. That's right. And it comes through whether it's the Revised Standard Version, the Revised Version, the King James sure. Version, um, we can be assured that each one of those is going to give us the truth of God's message. Right, and that's what we're after. So we're in chapter 2, 1 John, verse 15. We read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, one of the things we were talking about earlier, Stan, was this this word lust. Mm-hmm. Um, in today's society, and I know for me in many respects, and, and perhaps for others as well, we tend to think of that being of a sensual or a sexual nature. Um, but that's um, what you'd explain to me, is that's not quite the sole meaning that the Scriptures uses. No, I don't believe it is. I believe it's lust is like fire. It's like a fire that shoots off in us at, at the mere thought of something, whether it's rage or whether it's temptation uh, uh, of the opposite sex. or it's, it's, a, it's like a fire, and we can use it to burn down a house or warm the house. The lust, the Greek word epithumia, was also used, inter- interestingly enough, by Jesus in Luke in chapter 22 and verse 15. Now, this is the hour of his Passover meal, the night before he's crucified. uh, And it says, he said unto them, this is reading Luke 22, verse 15. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So the word with desire is the same word that is translated lust. Back in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Okay. It's the same word. But you notice it's Jesus had that desire. He had a, a strong urge, a strong passionate feeling to sit down and eat with his disciples that last supper before his death. And it's interesting here again, just to highlight the fact that the Revised Standard Version puts a, just a little bit different uh, thought on it because mm-hmm. it, as the word it says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover. That's it. Yeah. With the King James Version it said, with desire I desire. So this right. earnestly desired then helps us understand then this word lust in a little bit different context. So yeah. it, it is that, um, that strong sense, the passion, if you will, right. either for good or for bad, but it's the lust of the flesh then that we were focused on in 1 John 2 is the idea that those things of the world, the natural, um, natural man, what we would do naturally mm-hmm. is of the world and so our message and the Bible's message is all about change then. That's right. About being able to um, harness, if you will, and, and put some boundaries around that passion, around our lust. That's and, exactly and right. conform to the authority of God. Good. Circumscribing our uh, passions within due bounds in the sense that if we, as we mentioned in our first uh, taping, that the Genesis record reveals how we came to um, a position as human beings like 
55 gallon drums of gasoline ready to explode at the drop of a match, how we came to become so weak in controlling our feelings. Now, you'll recall that in Genesis chapter 2, when God planted the trees of the Garden of Eden, it says, verse 9, Genesis 2, verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. Right. Now, those are two of the channels that Eve fell into at the suggestion of the serpent. When the serpent had suggested that she would not die, that negated the commandment of God that said they would die. And then she saw, in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 6, the woman saw the tree was good for food. Well, that desire had already been taken care of by God with all the trees of the garden. And it was a tree, and it was pleasant to the eyes, which is, again, the same phrase used in chapter 2, verse 9. That desire, pleasing to the eyes, had been taken care of by the Father in the garden with all the other trees. Mm -hmm. But when those two desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, coupled with the tree, uh, or the desire to, a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. life, when those three were triggered by the thinking of the serpent, the lie of the serpent, then when God laid the burden upon them of mortality, those desires became deceitful. You see how because of the lie of the serpent, those desires became very deceitful. We're a people, a race of a species that we basically like to be deceived. The marketing world knows that. The psychologists that work with marketers to sell products know how much we like to have an illusion built about how successful that we will be with their product, how we'll never get a girl unless we use such and such soap and such and such deodorant and <laughs> right, such and such right. toothpaste. All of these are appealing and working on those deceitful desires. What we need is the truth of the matter and of the pro and, a, and a process, you know, so let, let's let's step back though before we head into mm -hmm. that, okay. just to be sure that we're making a connection here. Sure. So we took our our theme verse in First John two in this lust of the flesh, right. and we saw how that was played out way back in the beginning. So right. this is something that that the in writing the letter to John um, wasn't something new. This nope. was something that had come up way back in the creation. Exactly. Eve had been um, been under this uh, this direction, right. if you will. And so what we're talking about today, and really what the Bible's message is about, is a framework for change yes. then. So recognizing that that is our condition, mm -hmm. and if left to our own devices, we would be no different than Eve. That's right. Um, what we're talking about then is using God's word of truth for mm -hmm. change. Right. Now, I, I could, I'd like to suggest us turning to Isaiah 55. Okay. And um, noticing that we are basically the soil in which ideas, which you could call seeds, are planted. Now, when these ideas grow with our desires, and we devote a lot of energy to these ideas, eventually they materialize. As Jesus said in the Beatitudes, it was really more than committing adultery physically, it was looking upon a woman with lust in your heart to commit mm -hmm. adultery. Mm -hmm. The thinking, the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth. So we think these false ideas, false assumptions. Now, in Isaiah 55, verse 8, we're told by God, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And then he gives us a picture in verse 12 of the kingdom age when those who have been brought to spiritual production in not only mind but in morals and in finally physical glory of immortality, they replace that in verse 13. He says, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So here you have the results, you have the process, 
And I'd like to kind of show you, uh, our viewers what I have found to be uh, an interesting framework for the process of change. And okay. if I could, please. And um, I think that's important because, again, let's go back to the fact that what we're talking about is change. Right. We are, if you will, the old man, mm -hmm. the natural man. We will, left to our devices, sem. Right. That's correct. And what we're trying to do, because we have said, I want to follow God's way, mm -hmm. I, I accept that what he has said is um, it will be a better life, if we are living in his way. So we got to change in order to do that. We do. We cannot remain happy and satisfied with the way we are. So we might say, well, people are just going to have to take me the way I am because I'm not changing. But that's not the right attitude right. if we really want to be productive people. But notice this pyramid. The basis of the pyramid is thought. Now, that's the basis of everything, all our conduct, which is the pinnacle of the pyramid. But in between, on the basis of thought, we have feelings. Now, feelings, is, we've heard the old battle cry, if it feels good, do it. Right. But feelings seem to be what people avoid when it comes to perhaps even doctrine of religious matters. Don't get into that. That's controversial. You'll hurt somebody's feelings. Wearing your feelings on your coat sleeve is not a good thing. Right. But people are really basing a lot of their judgment upon feelings alone. They're not getting back down to the basis, fundamental principle to become principled people in their lives. What if it feels good, do it, is really the cry of the age, isn't it? But feelings, to give you an example, if you were sitting at home and at night the storm's outside and you hear something banging on the door and, and back door and you become a little bit alarmed, uh, you might think somebody was breaking in, thinking the worst case scenario. And suddenly you finally get to the door and realize it's just the branch of a tree that is blown down and blowing against the door. Suddenly intelligent understanding of the facts removes that false assumption that stirred the fear that caused you to go to the closet and get your gun and that you could have caused some real damage to yourself or somebody else. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. intelligent facts, changing the assumptions at the mental level produces feelings of, oh, I'm sure glad that wasn't a burglar coming right. in the back door. And then you're reassured. And then your character begins to develop on the basis of clear thinking. Facts, not false assumptions, delusions, deceptive, instinctive feelings of the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, producing a conduct that is more like Jesus Christ. That's called God manifestation. And we manifest God. We weren't brought into creation for the purpose of being saved or lost. Right. There was no reason for being saved or lost when God created man. He created man to manifest his characteristics. And sin entered in because of a delusion, a lie. And that voice of the serpent has been going ever since. I think it's helpful at this point to recognize that what you've laid out for us here is a framework for a change. So recognizing that it's through our changing our thoughts that we can change our feelings, that we can then lead to a change in character as those thoughts become a habitual pattern for us. And then if we change our character, we are, in effect, changing our conduct, our behavior. That's right. And that that's not just something you made up no. that's scriptural. That, yes, it is. That is, that there's a basis for that. And the, the verse that we were looking at previously is in Proverbs 29. Mm -hmm. and, and there's several verses that I think are really helpful to understand God's principles in this regard. Um, starting in Proverbs 29, and verse 18, one that we looked at in our previous program is, Right. Where there is no prophecy, or as it says in the King James Version, where there is no vision, mm -hmm. um, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Then the, the two, next two verses really apply to our framework of, of change here then. Mm -hmm. By mere words, a servant is not disciplined, for though he understands, he will not give heed. Mm, that's and, really and that's good. That's all about taking that thoughts and feelings, and then it becoming a way that we act, a way that we behave. That's right. Not just words, where we, we sit around and talk about God, and we talk about what's good and what's right, and then we go out and do whatever we want to do anyway. That's right, because you see, we don't want an authority in our lives by nature. We don't want somebody telling us what to do, and God tells us what to do for our own good. But we come out of school, we come out of wherever, out of society, and we say we don't want an authority. But those are excellent words. Somebody can preach at us and preach at us and preach at us. But that's what's so wonderful about our brotherhood is that we're teachers. We simply make the information available to the right. viewers, to our, to our friends, our family who will give heed and listen. And, uh, and that shows us that we can change. 
I'd really like to show you, run through this uh, little chart or demonstration here. Uh, if you'll notice that uh, on this particular chart, we'll start with um, assumption A, and we'll say that behavior A comes from assumption A. And those Tell assumptions, us what you mean a little bit by, the, by that idea of assumption. Sure. The assumptions are the ideas that we accumulate in our lives over a period of growth and time, whether they're the collective mindset of society dating back for hundreds of years, traditional values, assumptions that the Bible says this, assumptions that we can do this without, uh, uh, without punishment, uh, all sorts of false ideas, basically. Okay, and another, another way that we might think of that is there, there's a word that's used a lot now called our paradigm. Yeah. It's, yep. it's what we yes. believe, how we see the world. The paradigm might be as an example that um, as the man, I'm supposed to be the right. breadwinner. Right. That's a paradigm. Yes, That's an assumption is. that you're right. talking about here. And okay. there's also something called a paradigm shift where everybody goes back to square one and all the paradigms break down. And that's really what will happen when Christ returns. But if you'll notice on this chart, continuing from assumption A okay. to behavior A, we, we, we develop some, some uh, confusion in our lives, perhaps. We develop bad habits. It might be alcoholism or drug abuse or, or voyeurism, pornography, uh, crime, uh, petty theft, whatever, uh, vulgarity. It leads to dysfunction in our lives, which is the next block on the flow chart. And then it leads to disease, uh, uh, alcoholism, uh, drug abuse, addiction. And then it, it can lead to a situation called a significant emotional event. Right. Okay. And that could be a car wreck, just for, to use one example of many, uh, a car wreck that nearly kills someone in our family, or perhaps it does kill someone in our family, and we're remaining alive carrying the load of guilt. Sure. Well, the world puts a lot of guilt on us. Religious institutions know how to use guilt as a manipulative uh, uh, tool to get what they want and to get their members into church. But here we have a life-death instinct, uh, the, the will to survive uh, versus a death instinct, a death wish. And so at that point of a significant emotional event, we're going to say, no, I give up and end our life or, or, or fall into neglect that we uh, lose our life, and it results in, as you see, this last box, which is death. Mm -hmm. However, if we decide, and we're not happy with the way we are and the results of our life, and we decide that, yes, I want to live, and that was my case. I reached rock bottom, and I said, I've got to do something. I'm losing my wife. I'm, I'm going to lose my life. I'm losing my friends. And I was into such a paranoid delusion uh, on, uh, on, as because of the results of drugs and drinking and partying. Uh, I finally said yes, and so I was determined. But you know, Mark, emotional reversal is, and no matter how determined we are, that's not going to solve the problem. We, we go up, as you can see this flow chart, the arrow points up. We're reversing our downward descent into the grave. We're now reversing it with all the energy and all the determination and conviction we can muster. But if somebody says, let me help you, we say, oh, no, no, <laughs> pride of life can enter in sure. and say, no, I can do this myself, not to worry, I can handle it, I can handle it. In many cases, uh, people want to, uh, they, they need to recognize they're alcoholics, and they don't, state of denial. Oh, I don't need to go to AA, I'm, I can quit anytime I want to. But then pretty soon you'll notice the flow chart turns us right back like a being lost in the woods and that circle of, of wandering ends up in a complete circle. We keep listing to the left or the right. And we end up in bad habits again. And then it results in dysfunction, disease, and then we, we hit and another one. another moment. emotional issue. It's a constant habitual cycle of return to our old way of life. So how do we break it before? Well, it... And that, that's the key is in what you recognized in some way in mm -hmm. your own life mm -hmm. was a desire to break it. That's and, right. And that it needs to be broken. And Otherwise, I'm... we just keep on going. Oh, and I'll never forget the day that I, I, I ran to the, uh, to, to the telephone building where my wife was working, and I pulled her, out of the, pulled her out of her office and shook her and said, you're going out with somebody. And it was a delusion in my head. Probably as a man thinketh in his own heart, so is he. I'm projecting these shadows and images on some other people, deference, transmission of anger and rage and, and my own adulterous mind. And put, brought her to tears so I could touch reality again because I couldn't see reality in a straight face. 
straight face. So, so in that example, your personal example then, what is it that caused you to break that cycle? I had to leave. I ran out, got in the van, pouring down rain. The streets of Houston, the buildings going up looked like a graveyard. And I prayed and prayed and prayed the most earnest and convicting prayer a man could ever pray and asked God to show me the truth. And he led me to a Christadelphian within about three days. And I likened that to a resurrection. It was the beginning. So notice this chart continues on to assumptions, uh, mental reversal, and you reverse those assumptions to facts in the Word, to assumptions B, behavior B, decisions, hope, happiness, health, and life, and a place in God's kingdom. And I hate to rush through that, but we're running out yeah, of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. Sure. And Stan, thank you very much for spending the time with us to uh, help us understand God's framework for making a change in our life. Thank you. And friends, we thank you for joining us. Uh, we will have some other discussions around the same subject, but we'll move on from our discussion of the lust of the flesh to the lust of the eyes. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, the Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth.